Good morning. This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. I'm John Trout. It's Wednesday, January 24th, 2024. Here's what's coming up on America in the Morning. Donald Trump scores another big victory as Nikki Haley gets a little bit closer last night in New Hampshire. She didn't win. She lost. I'm John Stolness. More reaction and suggested defiance surrounding a Supreme Court decision on the southern border. I'm Clayton Neville. U.S. forces in the Middle East have carried out more strikes. I'm Ben Thomas with the latest. A 14-week abortion ban on the table in Wisconsin. I'm Pamela Furr. On Wall Street, the S&P 500 index and the Nasdaq each open at fresh record highs this morning. I'm Jessica Ettinger. Charles Osgood, who anchored CBS Sunday Morning for more than two decades, has died at the age of 91. I'm Shelley Adler. And finally, a report on the most bedbug-infested cities in the nation. All ahead on America in the Morning. After a double-digit win in Tuesday's New Hampshire primary, Donald Trump has his second straight victory over Nikki Haley, although this one was much closer. John Stolness has details. The former president feeling good about his comfortable victory in the Granite State. We'll head out to South Carolina, where I think we're going to win easily. I think we're 50 points up, 5-0. 5-0, 50 points up on a person that was governor. That tells you something. While not a 30-point win like last week in Iowa, the Trump campaign calling for Haley to drop out of the race after last night's results. Haley, however, says she's not going anywhere. Now, you've all heard the chatter among the political class. They're falling all over themselves, saying this race is over. Well, I have news for all of them. New Hampshire is first in the nation. It is not the last in the nation. Haley sounding a triumphant tone in her speech to supporters, a fact that did not escape Trump when he spoke not long after. And she was up and I said, wow, she's doing uh, like a speech like she won. She didn't win. She lost. And, you know, this is not your typical victory speech, but let's not have somebody Take a victory when she had a very bad night. In New Hampshire, undeclared voters can vote in either primary. And according to exit polls from ABC News, 47 percent of voters carried that label. And in what could be a sign of trouble for Trump in a general election, those undeclared and independent voters voted for Haley two to one. This race is far from over. Today we got close to half of the vote. We still have a ways to go, but we keep moving up. And after once again hitting Trump on confusing her for Nancy Pelosi over the weekend regarding January 6th security, Haley responded to Trump's claims that he would beat her on a series of cognitive and aptitude tests. Maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't. But if he thinks that, then he should have no problem standing on a debate stage with me. Trump, meanwhile, flanked by former candidates Vivek Ramaswamy and South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, spending much of his victory speech bragging about his poll numbers and attacking President Biden. We are going to win this. We have no choice. If we don't win, I think our country is finished. I do. I believe our country is finished. On the Democratic side, the president comfortably won that primary as a write-in candidate over Dean Phillips and Marianne Williamson. In a statement, his campaign agreed with Trump that it's now clear the former president will be the Republican nominee and that democracy itself hangs in the balance. John Stolness, Washington. There's more reaction to a Supreme Court decision surrounding the southern border, including encouragement by a Texas congressman to ignore the ruling. Correspondent Clayton Neville reports. The U.S. Supreme Court in a 5-4 to four ruling this week said that federal Border Patrol agents can resume taking down razor wire stood up by Texas Guard members at the southern border. Texas has been deploying the wire to deter illegal immigration. This crisis, this catastrophe that is unfolding every day at our southern border, that is unfolding all across the state of Texas, it is deliberate and it is man-made. Senator Ted Cruz told WBAP Radio in Dallas that border towns are simply overrun and, as he has many times before, put blame directly on Biden and administration policies, or some say a lack thereof. He said border towns are simply overwhelmed. So if 110,000 is destroying New York City, what the hell do you think 9.6 million is doing to Texas and the rest of the southern border? The White House defending the Biden administration lawsuit against Texas says Texas Guard members continue to block federal agents from entering a border park in Eagle Pass. The Border Patrol needed access, and that's why we sued to get rid of that uh, razor wire so that they could do their jobs. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby responding to critics as more than 300,000 migrants were processed at the southern border last month alone. 
the idea that we don't have a plan or a strategy or we're not taking this seriously is just not borne out by the facts. And, you know, again, if the if, if the folks in the, on the House Republican side are, are serious about border security, and they claim they are, then they should act on the supplemental request and, you know, let's negotiate this in good faith. Critics of the Supreme Court decision are concerned that the ruling will only boost illegal immigration numbers. And Texas Governor Greg Abbott maintains that the state has a sovereign authority to protect its borders. But the federal government argues the border is not a state issue, but a federal jurisdiction instead. Texas Congressman Chip Roy told Fox News Digital that Texas should ignore the ruling, suggesting that if the high court wants to ignore that truth, quote, Texas leaders still have a duty to defend their people. I'm Clayton Neville. U.S. forces strike targets inside Iraq when America in the morning returns after these messages. Welcome back here with America in the Morning on where those wiper blades might come in handy today with the national forecast. Here's AccuWeather.com meteorologist Carl Erickson. Well, the wiper blades and umbrellas will come in handy across much of the eastern and southern part of the nation today, as well as the west coast. There will be rounds of rain today along the Gulf Coast states where some of the rain will be heavy enough to cause localized flooding from Houston to New Orleans. The rain will also spread northward through the Tennessee and Ohio valleys and extend across the Great Lakes and northeast. Fog and reduced visibility can cause travel and flight delays in many of these areas receiving rain today. Despite the rainy weather, very mild spring-like air will be felt across southern Texas into the southeast with highs in the 60s with 70s running from the Gulf Coast into the coastal Carolinas. It will feel more like April across most of Florida with highs in the 80s under a mix of clouds and sunshine. Even the Ohio Valley and Mid-Atlantic states will thaw out from the cold weather with high temperatures rebounding into the 40s and 50s. There'll be just enough lingering cold air in place for some morning snow around Boston, but even here a changeover to rain and drizzle is expected by this afternoon. Snow will hang on a little longer over northern New England and accumulate a couple of inches. There will still be an icy mix through the morning hours over parts of northern Iowa and northern Wisconsin, but even here, the warmer air will win out this afternoon with a changeover to rain. Clouds and a few showers will linger over the southern plains into New Mexico. Meanwhile, the west coast will remain wet with showers from northern California to Washington, while snow will pile up in the Cascades and Sierra Nevada. Much of the northern plains and northern Rockies will be dry with clouds and sunshine. And that's the weather across America. In Chicago today, foggy with rain, high 40. Meanwhile, in San Francisco, showers in a high near 70. That's the nation's weather. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Carl Erickson. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. I'm John Trout. A number of American troops have been injured after U.S. forces unleashed a retaliatory strike on Iranian-backed Hezbollah fighters inside Iraq. Correspondent Ben Thomas reports. The U.S. military struck three facilities in Iraq Tuesday. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin says they were targeting an Iranian-backed militia in retaliation for missile and drone attacks on American troops in Iraq and Syria over the past several days. The strikes came hours after the U.S. said militants fired two one-way attack drones at Al-Assad Air Base in western Iraq, injuring U.S. service members and damaging infrastructure. And that followed the militia's most serious attack on the base this year when it launched multiple ballistic missiles on Saturday. The Al-Assad base is where U.S. troops have trained Iraqi security forces and now coordinate operations to counter the Islamic State group. Ben Thomas, Washington. Both opponents and supporters of abortion access have testified at the Wisconsin State Capitol on a bill that, if passed, would ban abortions after 14 weeks of pregnancy. Pamela Fur has that story. The only exception to the ban would be where a mother's health is at risk with no exceptions for rape or incest. Two Republicans co-authored the bill, one from the state House and one from the state Senate, saying the proposal was a middle-of-the-road approach that offered an alternative to either a total ban or the absence of any restrictions on abortions. Now, during a public hearing at the state capitol earlier this week, a parade of speakers from both sides of the argument testified against the bill. Political parties use abortion as an emotional, shiny object to distract people from what's really going on. Putting this bill forward um, does signal that the legislature's doubts about 
is so awfulness, and I don't think that's a good message to send. I think abortion should be unrestrictive. And I think when somebody finds out in pregnancy, when or how far along that they are when someone finds out, they should be able to get an abortion if they want to. And for some people, that is full term. Now, if the bill were to pass, it would likely be vetoed by Democratic Governor Tony Evers, who has said he would reject any efforts to place new restrictions on abortion access. Now, currently, Wisconsin has a 20-week ban in place, a law that was signed by former Governor Scott Walker. I'm Pamela Furr. When we return on America in the Morning, airing out his frustrations, United Airlines CEO Scott Kirby on Boeing after these messages. America in the Morning continues. Two small airlines are planning large expansions of their routes. Denver-based Frontier Airlines will be adding dozens of new nonstop routes to domestic and international destinations starting in April. Cities include Charlotte, Dallas, New York, and Salt Lake City, along with special $19 flights. Low-cost carrier Breeze is also planning a summer expansion, adding 11 new routes and adding new service to airports, including Denver, Greenville, Spartanburg in South Carolina, and Mobile, Alabama. Well, Wall Street continues its winning ways. Here's CNBC's Jessica Ettinger. Wall Street opens this morning with the S&P 500 index and the Nasdaq at new all-time highs. The Dow was in the red, pulling back from that 38,000 market hit for the first time ever this week. It was down 96 points yesterday. Netflix reported mixed quarterly results after the closing bell last night, but shares popped higher in after-hours trading because it added 13 million new subscribers in the quarter, more than expected. Plus, it just announced its biggest live entertainment event deal ever with WWE. This is a big deal for Netflix. So far, it's just done these one-off sporting events, but this really does mark a huge shift. This program, which currently airs on USA Network and produces three hours of live programming per week, is a 10-year deal valued at more than $5 billion, and it will enable Netflix to make WWE documentaries or series like it has with Formula One and golf. So this is Netflix's biggest move into live content yet. CNBC's Julia Borston. Johnson & Johnson will settle with more than 40 states looking into whether J&J misled patients about the safety of its talc products, including baby powder, which it stopped making. The tentative deal does not resolve tens of thousands of lawsuits alleging the baby powder with talcum caused cancer. General Motors unveiled a redesigned Chevy Equinox. It's more rugged, Standard heated steering wheel and seats now. Current models start around $28,000. No pricing yet on this upgraded version for 2025. Well, Scott Kirby of United Airlines basically canceled his order with Boeing live on the air. Yeah, it was amazing. The United Airlines CEO went on our TV channel yesterday and pretty much said United is about to pull back from an order of new Boeing 737 MAX 10 jets because the MAX 9s are grounded. The MAX-10 hasn't even been certified yeah. at this point. Do you still believe you're going to get those planes and when do you think you get them? Yeah, so we're now, best case, five years behind on the original delivery uh, of the MAX-10. Um, and as we've gone through the last year, internally at United, we've grown increasingly to believe that best case, the MAX-10 just gets pushed further and further to the right. So we'd already started working on alternative plans. I think this is the straw, the MAX-9 grounding is probably the straw that broke the camel's back for us. Uh, we're going to at least build a plan that doesn't have the MAX-10 in it. United Airlines CEO Scott Kirby with CNBC's Phil LeBeau. On today's watch list, a load of earnings coming from AT&T, IBM, Kimberly Clark, and Tesla. We get the latest read on U.S. economic growth with GDP, gross domestic product numbers. McDonald's putting the double Big Mac back on menus today after a false start because the pandemic hit. CNBC's Jessica Ettinger with a look at Wednesday business headlines. When we return on America in the Morning, the most bed bug infested cities in the country after these messages. Welcome back here with America in the Morning. 
Charles Osgood, who anchored CBS Sunday morning for more than two decades, has died at the age of 91. More on his passing from correspondent Shelley Adler. Good morning. I'm Charles Osgood, and this is Sunday Morning. CBS Sunday Morning probably is his, uh, is his masterpiece. Robert Thompson, a professor of pop culture at Syracuse University, who says Charles Osgood's style was different than your typical newscaster. It was this much more avuncular, conversational, uh, over the uh, you know fence in the backyard uh, kind of feel. And I think that was appealing to a lot of people. CBS reported that Osgood died Tuesday at his home in New Jersey. The cause of death, according to his family, was dementia. I'm Shelley Adler. Out with their annual list, which could be entitled Guaranteed to Make Your Skin Crawl, the pest control company Orkin released their ranking of the most bed bug infested cities in the United States. For the first time, Greensboro, North Carolina has broken into the top echelon for tiny critters. Four cities from Ohio, Youngstown, Columbus, Cincinnati, and Cleveland were also within the top 20. The nation's capital was rated number seven. The top three cities for bed bug infestation in the nation in order, Chicago, New York City, and Philadelphia. America in the Morning for Wednesday, January 24th, 2024, is produced by Jeff McKay, senior producer Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One. This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. I'm John Trout. Coming up this half hour. Donald Trump scores another big victory as Nikki Haley gets a little bit closer last night in New Hampshire. She didn't win. She lost. I'm John Stolness. President Biden, Vice President Harris and their spouses will all hit the trail together. Sagar Magani, Washington. Flooding in Southern California leads to a disaster declaration. I'm Clayton Neville. Guilty of shooting a woman who went up the wrong driveway in New York. I'm Jeff McKay with the details. Three new names for Cooperstown. I'm Robert Workman. The Oscar nominations are in. I'm Kevin Carr. A pastor in a small city in Ohio are tussling over the legality of his 24-7 homeless ministry. I'm Ed Donahue. Back after these messages. Welcome back. You're with America in the Morning. Some folks across the country will be experiencing some spring-like weather today. Here's AccuWeather.com meteorologist Carl Erickson. A large portion of the nation will be undergoing a January thaw today and over the next couple of days as the bitterly cold Arctic air that was gripping many areas has retreated north into Canada. The most dramatic warm-up today will take place across the Ohio Valley and mid-Atlantic states where highs will be in the 40s and 50s. Very mild spring-like air will be felt across southern Texas into the southeast with highs in the 60s with 70s running from the Gulf Coast into the coastal Carolinas. It will feel more like April across most of Florida with highs in the 80s. Unfortunately, this time of the year, it is rare to get such mild temperatures across such a large portion of the nation without a lot of clouds and precipitation, and that will be the case today. There will be rounds of rain accompanying the mild weather today along the Gulf Coast states, where some of the rain will be heavy enough to cause localized flooding from Houston to New Orleans. Rain will spread northward through the Tennessee and Ohio valleys and extend across the Great Lakes and Northeast, and many of these areas receiving rain today also have reduced visibility in areas of fog, which may produce travel delays. There'll be just enough lingering cold air in place for some morning snow around Boston, but even here a changeover to rain and drizzle is expected by this afternoon. Snow will hang on a little longer over northern New England and accumulate a couple of inches. There will still be a nicey mix through the morning over parts of northern Iowa and Wisconsin, but even here the warmer air will win out this afternoon with a changeover to rain. Clouds and a few showers will linger over the southern plains into New Mexico. Meanwhile, much of the northern plains and northern Rockies will be dry under clouds and sunshine. The west coast will remain wet with showers from northern California to Washington, while snow will pile up in the Cascades and Sierra Nevada. That's the nation's weather. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Carl Erickson. Follow us where you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, YouTube. Just search America in the morning in your favorite listening app. I'm John Trout.
It was a large turnout for the New Hampshire primary, with Donald Trump scoring his second victory after capturing the Iowa caucuses last week. This time it was a two-person race between the former president and Nikki Haley, who had a much closer showing than she did with her third-place finish in Iowa. As John Stolnes reports, it was independent voters who helped boost Haley, who vowed to remain in the race despite calls by Trump that she step aside. The former president feeling good about his comfortable victory last night in the Granite State. We'll head out to South Carolina, where I think we're going to win easily. I think we're 50 points up, 5-0. 5-0, 50 points up on a person that was governor. That tells you something. While not a 30-point win like last week in Iowa, the Trump campaign calling for Haley to drop out of the race after last night's results. Haley, however, says she's not going anywhere. Now you've all heard the chatter among the political class. They're falling all over themselves, saying this race is over. Well, I have news for all of them. Woo! New Hampshire is first in the nation. It is not the last in the nation. Haley sounding a triumphant tone in her speech to supporters, a fact that did not escape Trump when he spoke not long after. And she was up and I said, wow, she's doing uh, like a speech like she won. She didn't win, she lost, and you know. This is not your typical victory speech, but let's not have somebody take a victory when she had a very bad night. In New Hampshire, undeclared voters can vote in either primary. And according to exit polls from ABC News, 47 percent of voters carried that label. And in what could be a sign of trouble for Trump in a general election, those undeclared and independent voters voted for Haley two to one. This race is far from over. Today we got close to half of the vote. We still have a ways to go, but we keep moving up. John Stolnes, Washington. Despite not campaigning in the Granite State and not even being on the ballot, President Joe Biden, as a write-in candidate, took first place by a landslide in the Democrat primary. While GOP candidates were searching for votes, President Biden, Vice President Harris, and their spouses all hit the campaign trail together for the first time this year at a rally for abortion rights. Washington correspondent Sagar Magani reports. Former President Trump hand-picked, hand-picked three Supreme Court justices because he intended for them to overturn Roe. He intended for them to take your freedoms. He is the architect of this health care crisis. That reflects the importance Democrats are putting on abortion this year. Let there be no mistake. The person most responsible for taking away this freedom in America is Donald Trump. St. Anselm College political scientist Chris Galdieri says it also factors in the president's approval ratings. A president whose numbers are not what... Uh, any Democrat would want them to be at the start of the general election campaign. The Virginia rally comes a day after the vice president hammered likely GOP nominee Donald Trump for saying he was proud of his role in overturning Roe v. Wade. Proud? Proud that women across our nation are suffering? While Harris and Democrats are embracing abortion as a campaign issue, many Republicans are shying away, worried about sparking more voter backlash. Secrecy. Shame, silence, danger, even death. That's what defined that time for so many women. And because of Dobbs, that's where we're finding ourselves back again, refighting the battles we had fought and thought we had settled years ago. Sagar Megani, Washington. Turkey has scheduled a long-delayed vote on Sweden's bid to join NATO in a step that could remove a major hurdle for the previously non-aligned Nordic country's entry into the military alliance. As correspondent Charles de Ledesma reports, this comes the same day a Russian missile attack hit two Ukrainian cities, killing at least six people and wounding dozens. NATO member Turkey has been dragging its feet on ratifying Sweden's accession for more than a year, accusing the country of being too lenient toward groups it regards as security threats. It has been seeking concessions from Sweden, including a tougher stance towards Kurdish militants and members of a network blamed for a failed coup in 2016. Also, Ankara has been angered by Quran-burning protests that have roiled the Muslim world. However, arguing in favour of Sweden's bid, the Deputy Foreign Minister has 
has cited steps Sweden's taken to meet Turkish demands, including lifting restrictions on defence industry sales and amending anti-terrorism laws. We will support Ukraine uh, with the systems and the weapons and the ammunition they need um, uh, to prevail as a sovereign independent uh, country. Uh, because we cannot allow um, President Putin to win in Ukraine. That would be a tragedy for the Ukrainians and dangerous for all of us. The Russian barrage included more than 40 ballistic crews, anti-aircraft and guided missiles. At a scene of destruction in Kharkiv, rescue workers cleared debris. Kharkiv Mayor Ihor Terekov says an entire section of a multi-storey residential building has been destroyed, trapping an unknown number of people. <laughs> Ukraine's national police have shared video showing the aftermath of the strike, with injured people being given medical assistance. I'm Charles Dulodesma. When we return on America in the morning, Southern California state of emergency and TurboTax forced to change its marketing methods. Those stories and more after these messages. This is America in the morning. Welcome back. I'm John Trout. Parts of Southern California are left in a state of emergency in the aftermath of torrential rain and flooding. Correspondent Clayton Neville has the latest. An emergency order issued for San Diego and Ventura counties by California Governor Gavin Newsom after nearly three inches of rain fell at San Diego International Airport on Monday alone. Cars and Californians were trapped in floodwaters. You can't see what's below you at all. I mean, the water is dirty and you have different things that are coming at you. But my main objective was to make sure that he was safe before the water got too deep. Neighbors seen helping neighbors. Some of them spoke with Fox 5 TV. And as the anchor, I was in the water up to my you know chest high too and pulling them in. I'm weighing almost 200 pounds and that water's pushing me over the entire time. So it was it was moving. When I arrived in the middle of the intersection right there, a flood of water just came right through. But the weather's to blame for evacuations and some school closures in the region. And the governor's disaster declaration says flooding, debris and mudslides all threatened critical infrastructure and life in the region. I'm Clayton Neville. A man was convicted of second-degree murder for fatally shooting a young woman when the SUV she was riding in mistakenly drove into his rural driveway in upstate New York. America in the Morning's Jeff McKay has the details. After deliberating for less than an hour, the jury found 66-year-old Kevin Monahan guilty of second-degree murder for shooting 20-year-old Kaylin Gillis. Gillis was in a car last April on a Saturday night that drove up the wrong driveway as they were trying to find another house in the rural town of Hebron, about 40 miles north of Albany. They turned around and began leaving once they realized their mistake, but Monahan came out on his porch, fired twice with a shotgun, the second shot hitting Gillis in the neck as she sat in the front passenger seat of an SUV driven by her boyfriend. Monahan and his attorney maintained the shooting was an accident involving a defective gun that fired as he tripped on his own porch. On the stand, Monahan said he believed the house he shared with his wife was, quote, under siege by a group he called marauders when they saw the vehicle approach. During the trial, prosecutors also used 911 calls showing Monahan lied to police about what happened. He now faces a 25-year-to-life sentence for his actions. I'm Jeff McKay. More is being learned about the man who killed eight people in Joliet, Illinois, then fled to Texas, where he took his own life. As correspondent Norman Hall reports, police say the suspect was related to most of the victims. Police in Joliet, Illinois, believe 23-year-old Romeo Nance shot seven people, most of whom were relatives, at two homes in Joliet on Sunday, before randomly shooting two men at other nearby locations. One of those men survived. This incident included several deceased persons in two separate residences. Nance fatally shot himself Monday in Texas when confronted by U.S. Marshals near San Antonio. We do know right now that there was a, a family relationship between the two residents, and we do know that um, Nance, was, uh, 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 Nance was related to uh, the occupants of, of both residents. As, as to exactly what type of relationship there was uh, within the family, uh, right now we're still sorting through that. As for motive, Joliet Police Chief Bill Evans says that has yet to be determined. We can't get inside his head. Uh, we just don't have any, uh, any clue as to why he did what he did. The 
victims range in age from 14 to 47 years old. I, Norman Hall. With tax season starting up, TurboTax is barred from advertising its services as free unless they are no cost for all consumers or if eligibility is clearly disclosed. Correspondent Julie Walker explains. In an opinion and final order, the Federal Trade Commission ruled that TurboTax maker Intuit engaged in deceptive practices by running ads claiming consumers could file their taxes for free using TurboTax, when in fact many taxpayers did not qualify for such free offerings. In addition to prohibiting Intuit from marketing its products or services as free unless there's actually no cost for everyone, the FTC said Intuit must disclose what percentage of consumers are eligible and note if a majority of taxpayers do not qualify. Intuit said it had appealed the decision, which it called deeply flawed. There was no financial penalty in the FTC's order, but Intuit has previously faced hefty charges over the marketing of free services. Julie Walker, New York. A new discovery may make super quantum computers cheaper and more energy efficient. Here's Chuck Palm with that in today's Tech News. Scientists have discovered a groundbreaking new superconductor with on-off switches. Physicists at the University of Washington and the U.S. Department of Energy Argonne National Laboratory have made a discovery that could help enable quantum-level superconductivity that reacts like current transistors in today's computers. This will allow for new energy-efficient, switchable superconducting circuits where current can flow through a material with zero resistance. Currently, computers use semiconducting transistors to quickly switch electric currents on and off, creating binary ones and zeros that's used in processing. The University of Washington team, led by Shua Sanchez, have come up with a way of applying a magnetic field to crystals and reorienting the magnetic field to create superconducting layers. This technology will dramatically enhance superconductivities in new quantum computers, making them more energy efficient and cheaper to run. Tell us what you think at allthetoptech.tech. I'm Chuck Palm. Wednesday Sports Now with Robert Workman on America in the Morning. Baseball's Hall of Fame will get three new members this summer, courtesy of the Baseball Writers Association. Third baseman Adrian Beltre, first baseman Todd Helton, and catcher Joe Maurer all got the good word on Tuesday. Beltre received over 96% of the votes, Maurer over 76%, each making it in his first year, while Helton garnered nearly 80% on his sixth try. The most emotional moment was when I realized I caught the ball and I realized we were going to go to a World Series. The 2007 season obviously was my favorite season. Reliever Billy Wagner missed by just five votes votes of the 75% threshold. He has one more year of eligibility, while outfielder Gary Sheffield had just under 64% in his final try before going to the Veterans Committee in 2026. NBA, the Nuggets got by the Pacers 114-109. Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic each scored 31 points. Jokic getting his 13th triple-double of the season and 118th overall. That's fourth all-time. Clippers got a triple-double from Kawhi Leonard in their victory over the Lakers, their first win over their stablemates this season. For Leonard, that brings his career total of triple-doubles up to Two. Knicks rallied past the Nets for their fourth straight win. Pelicans pounded the Jazz, and the Thunder nipped the Blazers. OKC now tied with Minnesota for the top record in the Western Conference. The Bucks fired first-year coach Adrian Griffin despite a 30-13 and record. That's second best in the association. Concerns over the team's defense are said to be the cause. Doc Rivers is at the top of Milwaukee's wish list to replace him. NHL, the Oilers won their 14th consecutive game, swatting the Blue Jackets 4-1. Edmonton now just three away from the record of 17 straight wins set by the Penguins over 30 years ago. Nikita Kucherov had a hat trick and a helper to lead the Lightning to a win over the Flyers. He leads the league now with 80 points. Golden Knights shaded the Islanders 40 saves for Aiden Hill. Wins for the Senators, Ducks, Stars, Wild, Sharks, and Blues. That's Wednesday Sports. Thank you, Robert. Coming up on America in the Morning, Pastors Homeless Ministry meets Community Opposition after these messages. Thanks for listening. This is America in the Morning. There were those who topped the list and a few surprising snubs with the release of the Oscar nominations. Kevin Carr has the results. 
The Oscar nominations were announced on Tuesday with some historic firsts and a few surprises. We're in a race against the Nazis. Not a surprise was Oppenheimer receiving 13 nominations, including Best Picture, Best Director, Killian Murphy for Best Actor, Robert Downey Jr. for Best Supporting Actor, and Emily Blunt for Best Supporting Actress. No! She's an experiment. Poor Things received 11 nominations, including Best Picture, Best Director, Emma Stone for Best Actress, and Mark Ruffalo for Best Supporting Actor. I did not fool. Evil surrounds my heart. Killers of the Flower Moon was nominated for 10 Oscars, including Best Picture and Robert De Niro for Best Supporting Actor. Lily Gladstone became the first Native American nominated for Best Actress. <laughs> and Martin Scorsese received his 10th nomination for Best Director, making him the most nominated living director. Okay, ladies, let's do this. Barbie received a Best Picture nomination, and America Ferreira was nominated for Best Supporting Actress. However, Greta Gerwig was overlooked for Best Director, and Barbie herself, Margot Robbie, was snubbed for Best Actress. Wow, this is the real world. <laughs> but I'm a man. But as suggested by the film itself, Ken, a.k.a. Ryan Gosling, was nominated for Best Supporting Actor, as was his soulful ballad, I'm Just Ken. So cool. For a full list of nominees, visit Oscars.com. I'm Kevin Carr. A David and Goliath story in the Rust Belt where a pastor and small city in Ohio are tussling over the legality of his 24-7 homeless ministry. Ed Donahue explains. Eighteen criminal charges have been filed in Bryan, Ohio against Dad's Place church pastor Chris Avell. He opened up his church for people needing shelter. It was quite Shocking, I'd say, and humiliating. Avell is accused of violating the zoning ordinance, lacking proper kitchen and laundry facilities, and had unsafe exits and inadequate ventilation. He is suing. My faith requires we sit down at the table as friends and, and work out things between one another. And if that can't happen, we take those next steps. The city's attorney says they continue to be interested in any business, any church, any entity complying with local and state law. Jeremy Dice is Avell's attorney. This is clear evidence that the city is wanting to drive this this church out of um, out of the city of Bryan, Ohio. The city says reports of inappropriate activity at the church began to increase back in May. I'm Ed Donahue. That's our show for today, Wednesday, January 24th, 2024. America in the Morning is produced by Jeff McKay. Senior producer Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One. <laughs>